It was only recently that we found out that charges had been dropped. Uh, I had never heard that in all my years. And the first thing that came to my mind is if the charges were dropped, why didn't anybody say so? And I don't know what was wrong with him, but he had some type of mental condition. Granddaddy, what happened to Mrs. Booth? Somebody killed that lady that knew about her when they was covering up and they had to put it on a black man and got him to confess to all of that stuff, but, but forced him to confess. A 16-year-old, five officers, this statement from the very beginning was coerced. You have somebody that's mentally disabled who is in a room for the first time, who has never been interrogated. They may not understand what they're being asked. They're more susceptible to pressure. Greetings from Dallas, Texas. My name is Angela Smith and I'm from a small town called Frierson, Louisiana. I currently live in Dallas where I'm a practicing certified registered nurse anesthetist, a published author and an independent filmmaker and an army reservist. Today, I'll be sharing a story with you um, that is inspired by curiosity in its purest form. Actually, it was inspired by my grandfather's gift of storytelling and his personal observation of injustice in the rural South back in the 1960s. Um, this is the story of a young man by the name of Lehman Howard, who um, his tragic experience as a mentally disabled youth who was charged with a crime that he was incapable of committing. Unfortunately, Lehman Howard's story is not unique. The deinstitutionalization of the mentally impaired in the 1950s and 60s due to uh, concerns regarding inhumane living conditions, efficacy of treatment and patient rights, in my opinion, created the perfect storm for Lehman Howard's experience. The community-based outpatient treatment that was meant to replace the shuttered mental health facilities never materialized. In cities, instead, cities and states basically um, resulted to um, policing and which ended up resulting in mass incarceration. In 1955, there were 500,000 mentally ill patients in the nation's public psychiatric hospitals, which was more than twice the number of prisoners. Between 1980 and 1994, the number of individuals incarcerated in American jails and prisons was from 500,000 to 1.5 million. As of 1994, there were roughly 72,000 patients in American psychiatric facilities. This is an increase of 216% of Americans who were incarcerated. The story of Lehman Howard is a demonstration of the complete failure of the judicial system in its approach to protecting individuals who can't protect themselves. And like many other cases, it all began with a crime. However, Lehman Howard's case was further complicated by the fact that this crime occurred in the Jim Crow South, in a state that has been called the prototype for that particular area, and in a place that was deemed the most racist city in America, during the, during the uh, civil rights movement. This story began to unfold on December 7th, 1960, when the wife of a prominent business owner was reported missing by her husband. Lehman Howard was 16 at the time of Mrs. Booth's murder. According to his sister, Lehman did not attend school um, on a regular basis. And this was because of his um, what she described as fits or emotional outbursts. As a result, he could barely read or write. And as an adolescent, there were frequent visits to the psychiatric ward in the, near, in the city nearby um, for the safety of his family and also himself because these outbursts were apparently sort of aggressive. Um, an official diagnosis was never provided to the family prior to his detainment, 
but his mental health history is well documented. Mrs. Booth's remains were discovered seven days later in Frierson, Louisiana, just down the road from Mr. Howard. However, this was approximately 24 miles from the location where she was last seen and the location of her car on the night of her disappearance. This, this would mean that Lehman Howard could not have committed this crime because as my grandfather used to speak about uh, Lehman Howard, he would always end by saying, the only thing Lehman Howard could drive was a plow. So this in and of itself was like proof that he couldn't have been the one who committed the crime. But in spite of this, almost immediately he, he became a person of interest due largely to his strange behavior, his strange behavior and his proximity where he lived to where the body was discovered. In an article published by the Harvard Law Review in 2021, the author states, at the onset of an investigation, a person with mental illness is more likely to become a suspect because symptoms of mental illness are often misinterpreted by law enforcement officers. Because symptoms of mental illness are often misinterpreted by law enforcement officers. Individuals with mental illness are also less likely to invoke their Miranda rights. Without counsels, these individuals are more susceptible to minimization and maximum, maximization techniques by law enforcement, which leads to a higher rate of false confession and ultimately convictions. This is exactly what happened to Lehman Howard. Over the 16 or 17 months after Mrs. Booth's remains were discovered near his home, the Howard family was harassed almost daily with threats of giving Lehman the uh, electric chair. This was in spite of the fact that the owner of the property um, insisted to law enforcement that he couldn't drive, that there was no way he could have committed this crime. And this is also consistent with my grandfather's assessment. This is extremely important, again, because the culprit, the actual person who committed this crime, had to know how to drive. And they had to know how to drive at night and in the rain because the night of her disappearance, it was raining. And so the case went cold until May of 1962, when Lehman Howard was admitted to the psychiatric hospital by his, his family for an exacerbation of his illness. While there, according to what I've read in the reports, he talked incessantly about Mrs. Booth's murder, which led one of the nurses to contact the local authorities. Lehman Howard was then taken from the psychiatric hospital without legal representation and, and interrogated throughout the night. And according to his sister, he was also beaten. Again, this was the Jim Crow South. So fear and intimidation and the threat of bodily harm would have been enough for any black person to confess to anything. And um, so imagine Lehman Howard in this position. At some point, he allegedly confessed to the murder with a full written confession. But the next day he repudiated his confession. This Repudiation was never reported in any of the local news outlets. I actually discovered it in a little newspaper in Galveston, Texas, just so happened. Um, and so, you know, he did confess, but he also repudiated the confession. But none of that really helped him at this point. It was he was down going down the road to being um, basically convicted of this crime. So for several months, Mr. Howard remained in the parish jail awaiting a lunacy hearing, and he was eventually sent down south to the psychiatric hospital where he was going to be held until he was deemed able to testify during his trial. But several years later, in 1966, apparently uh, Lehman Howard was in an altercation with another patient and allegedly, this person was killed by Lehman Howard. So now Lehman Howard has not only the Booth murder charge, but he's also charged with second degree murder of the second patient. Subsequently, he's held for another four years um, to see if he could stand trial. And in 1970, he did stand trial, but it wasn't for Mrs. Booth's murder. 
he stood trial for the second case and he was convicted and sent to Angola for 15 years, which was one of, is, is still one of the worst prisons in the country. And he was placed in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day with one hour of recreation. Um, the question that I've, I have about this is, if you're mentally disabled and um, how do you even, how do you come to the decision to um, try this individual? Um, and when they decided to try him, why didn't they try him for the first crime? I mean, why did they um, go forth with the second crime um, instead of trying him for Mrs. Booth's murder? That's the question that I have about this. Um, what actually compelled the authorities to try him for the second crime? Nonetheless, he's, he's sentenced to 15 years. Um, during his 15 years in Angola, Lehman Howard attempts suicide and he's sent back to the psychiatric hospital. Um, and eventually he's released after serving only six years on good behavior. Um, at this point, um, the, the uh, hospital administrators contact DeSoto Parish to see if they're ready to try him for Mrs. Booth's murder. At this point, they are told that the case was dropped, noli pro se. Um, this is very disturbing to me for a number of reasons. Uh, for one, his family was never contacted about this. In fact, after speaking to his niece, his family was under the assumption that he was serving time for Mrs. Booth's murder. They were never told about the second case. And so, you know, Lehman Howard basically did the time for the second murder and the charges were dropped for Mrs. Booth's murder. After Lehman Howard's release from Angola, he returned to the hospital and the hospital staff contacted the Soda Parish Police regarding Mrs. Booth's case. They were told that the charges had been dropped, noli pro se. Lehman Howard's family was never contacted regarding any of these proceedings. In fact, when I shared this information with them back in 2018, I was informed by his niece that the family was under the impression that Mr. Howard was serving time at Angola in the mental facility for the death of Mrs. Booth. In essence, the family was rendered powerless to intervene on Mr. Howard's behalf. On Mr. Howard's behalf. This was perhaps one of the greatest contributors to the perpetual injustice that he faced. In the process of my research, I managed to make contact with Mrs. Booth's family, and I was able to have a conversation with her granddaughter. Sadly, she and the rest of her family believed that justice had been served for her grandmother. Clearly, this was not the case. After reviewing the information that was brought forth from my research and the findings from the students at Southern University Law Center, they came to the conclusion that Mr. Howard was also a victim in this case. After his detainment for the lunacy evaluation in 1962, Lehman Howard never returned home. Of all the things that I've mentioned so far, what I'm about to share next has resonated with me the most. And on the surface, it, it'll probably seem like an extremely trivial piece of information. But when I discovered it back in 2017, it literally gave me chills. Lehman Howard passed away on September 26, 2004. Ironically, Mrs. Booth was born on September 26, 1904, exactly 100 years to the day of Lehman Howard's death. Again, this is trivial information, purely coincidental, However, it resonates with me because of the manner in which this story was presented to me by my grandfather. And this discovery basically fueled my passion to, to answer some of the questions that have gone unanswered. And so many questions, as I mentioned, have been, have been raised concerning the sequence of events in this case. The question for me again is this, if he was incapable of standing trial for Mrs. Booth's murder. How was he found competent to stand trial for the subsequent case? And if he was indeed competent, then why wasn't the initial charge of murder addressed first? How did this happen? At the top of the list, of course, is Mr. Howard's mental condition. 
which according to his medical records included a diagnosis of schizophrenia. As a result, the, as a result, the laws concerning involuntary commitment in the state of Louisiana warrants a discussion. An involuntary civil commitment is the legal process of placing a person in a mental institution against his or her will if that person poses a threat to himself or others. An involuntary criminal commitment is a legal process of involuntary confinement if a person is found not guilty by reason of insanity. Again, if this person um, has a potential to cause harm to himself or others. The applicability of the involuntary criminal commitment is questionable for Lehman Howard since the charges for Mrs. Booth's case were dropped and since he served the time for the other uh, murder. When it comes to the involuntary civil commitment, the state of Louisiana is unique for a number of reasons. Like many other states, being a licensed physician is not a re requirement for any parish or county in the country. In fact, in, in a parish near my, my hometown, the coroner is actually a minister. However, it is important to note that the state of Louisiana is the only state in which a coroner can initiate involuntary civil commitment proceedings for the mentally disabled. And number two, in the state of Louisiana, anyone of legal age can institute judicial proceedings to involuntary commit anyone if this person is believed to be a danger to himself or others. In an article written by the Southern University Law Students, Lehman Howard's nightmare began with the involuntary criminal commitment process. However, the involuntary civil commitment resulted in the 42 years of custody by the state of Louisiana. In the state of Louisiana, civil commitments are basically 180 day intervals, but they can be extended as long as it doesn't expire before the 180 days. This process was well documented in Lehman Howard's mental health record. And this type of system basically has a potential to result in indefinite confinement for anyone. In Lehman Howard's case, the initial charge of murder was enough to establish danger even after the charge was dropped. And this was made possible by his treating physician. Further complicating Lehman Howard's case is his misfortune of being treated or placed in the care of a physician by the name of A.T. Butterworth. Dr. Buttersworth provided care to mentally disabled patients in Angola and also at the state mental hospital where Lehman Howard was sent. Mr. Howard was initially placed in this doctor's care while awaiting his lunacy hearing for Mrs. Booth's murder. And he would remain in the care of this physician for 20 years. Due to the lengthy time span, I was compelled to Google this physician's name. My discoveries concerning this condition, this, my discoveries concerning this doctor and his background led me to contact a professor at Southern University Law School. Professor Angela Bell shared the story with her students, and they decided to use this case for their research project in 2019. The paper that they, um, the paper that was written was actually published in the 2019 edition of the American Bar Association's journal. Their findings confirmed my suspicions and much more. The law students at Southern were able to obtain a more complete record of Lehman Howard's um, psychiatric treatment. And they were also able to interview an inmate who actually served time with Lehman Howard back in the late 1960s. According to this inmate, Dr. Buttersworth was known as Dr. Death. And he, according to this inmate, um, many, of the, many of the prisoners were forced to undergo electroconvulsive shots and were given medications that left them in zombie-like positions or conditions. As it turns out, Dr. Buttersworth was involved in the government-approved experiment with LSD and other psychedelic drugs in various prisons across America to include Angola State Prison and the State Psychiatric Hospital 
which was nicknamed the Magic Mushroom. During one of his sessions, Lehman Howard stated that Dr. Buttersworth would inject him with leukemia. We know that it wasn't leukemia, um, but this comment kind of stood out to me. So in lieu of confirmation um, of LSD usage in Lehman Howard, this doctor's unorthodox deviations from the typical psychiatric practices of that particular time as it relates to Mr. Howard is best evidenced by the information obtained in Lehman Howard's medical record. The known side effects consistent with long-term use of LSD include hallucinations, psychotic episodes, recurring nightmares, changes in urination, excitement, and anxiety. According to the record, an exacerbation of each of these symptoms are noted. And each of these symptoms were noted um, um, extensively and they preceded Lehman Howard's suicide attempt. Um, in addition to this, the increasingly aggressive behavior that Mr. Howard demonstrated prior to the death of Mr. Bergeron, the, the patient who he was accused of killing, is consistent with the long-term effects of LSD and other antipsychotic medications. In light of these findings, the students from so Southern Law School made this comment, and I quote, one is left to wonder whether Mr. Howard's mental regression led to the death of Mr. Bergeron, which was committed while Mr. Howard was under the care of Dr. Buttersworth, end quote. Again, at this time, the evidence to firmly support the use of LSD in the treatment of Lehman Howard is purely circumstantial. However, again, according to the medical records, there is confirmation that Lehman Howard was subjected to electroconvulsive therapy. And he also received um, one medication in extremely high doses. Um, this medication is um, mind altering and it is extremely powerful, it, I mean, to say the least. Um, the name of this drug is Prolixin. And Prolixin is a first generation neuroleptic medication that was first introduced in 1959. This drug was associated with an extensive list of side effects to include a black box warning for sudden cardiac death. And it is contraindicated in patients who have seizures. Incidentally, Lehman Howard had a well-documented history of seizures. But in spite of this, he received this medication for over 20 years at dosages that exceeded the current dosing guidelines. According to the makers of this medication, the maximum therapeutic dose of prolixin is 20 milligrams per day or less. Lehman Howard received dosages that exceeded 50 to 60 milligrams for over 20 years. In the case of Lehman Howard, Dr. Buttersworth unethical practices concerning the use of mentally disabled prisoners for research purposes and his well-documented use of illegal substances resulted in Mr. Howard's tragic experience. According to both former and current inmates that were interviewed by the students, Dr. Buttersworth was known to have traded illicit drugs for sexual favors from inmates and used antipsychotic medications and LSD on unsuspecting and non-psychotic inmates without first obtaining their consent. As a healthcare provider, the failure to provide pertinent information and to ensure adequate understanding of risk is intolerable. Yet it seems this is not the case for those with mental disabilities who have the misfortune of receiving care from unethical practitioners. Dr. Buttersworth's fascination with illicit drugs eventually led to the suspension of his license um, after, he pleaded, after he pleaded guilty to marijuana and cocaine possession in 1985. The suspension was later lifted on the grounds of poor health due to a Parkinson's diagnosis and the desire to clear his record. Sadly, Lehman Howard and thousands of other inmates with mental disabilities are denied opportunities such as this. Very little has changed since the 1960s and 70s when it comes to the quality of care that is rendered in the prison system. 
Unqualified providers and providers with criminal pasts continue to exist. And this is particularly true in the state of Louisiana. Currently, 10 of the 12 physicians employed by Louisiana's correction system have restricted licenses or have had their licenses suspended in the past. This is in spite of the fact that both the National Commission on Correctional Health and the American College of Correctional Health strongly oppose the practice of hiring physicians with restricted license. The Louisiana Board of Medical Examiners is largely to blame for this due to its leniency on the matter, which allows physicians with restricted license to practice in certain institutions, particularly in prisons. With an incarceration rate of 1,094 per 100,000 people, which includes its prisons, jails, immigration detention, and juvenile justice facilities, Louisiana locks up a higher percentage of people than any democracy on earth. In Louisiana, Black people constitute 33% of its residents, but 52% of people in jail and 76% of people in prisons are Black. Since 1973, in the state of Louisiana, the possibility of parole was completely eliminated for life sentences, regardless of the crime, which means a life sentence is effectively a death penalty. Today, 73% of all inmates serving life in Angola are Black. So how did Louisiana become the prison capital of the entire world? And why is the state of Louisiana at the top of the list when it comes to wrongful convictions? And why are the majority of Louisiana prisons filled with African-Americans? Well, there are a number of reasons, but here's a few quick facts about Louisiana from a historical perspective. Cattle Parish, which is the home of Mrs. Booth and the location of the psychiatric hospital where Lehman Howard was initially arrested, was called Bloody Cattle because of the number of lynchings that took place in the post-Reconstruction era and during the Jim Crow era. Cattle Parish was the last capital of the Confederacy at the end of the Civil War, and it was the destination of Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederate States of America. Cattle Parish leads the state when it comes to death row inmates. Cattle Parish, has never ex Cattle Parish has never executed a white person for killing a black person. Cattle Parish was called the most racist city in America during the civil rights movement. And Cattle Parish inspired Sam Cook's A Change Is Gonna Come um, based on an experience that he had in Shreveport, which is located in Cattle Parish. This song would go on to become the anthem for the civil rights movement. So this is the place where Lehman Howard um, was charged with murder. This is the home of, of Mrs. Booth. So it's not a surprise to me that this happened to him based purely on the location of the crime. In the aftermath of slavery, Louisiana became the prototype for convict leasing. And Angola State Prison is a perpetual reminder. The facility is actually named for the enslaved people of Angola who lived on the property during slavery. In 1898, Louisiana's Constitutional Convention was held with one person in mind, and I quote, our mission was in the first place to establish the supremacy of the white race in this state to the extent to which it could be legally and constitutionally done. During this convention, which was called the most racist in the history of the country, I don't know, I read that somewhere. It may not be true, but that is what I read. Delegates put forth a number of statutes, one of which was called the non-unanimous jury system, which is partially responsible for mass incarceration, uh, which exists in the state today. Until 2018, Oregon and Louisiana were the only two states with a non-unanimous jury system. Unlike Louisiana, Oregon's system, which was implemented in 1934, excluded those cases where a defendant is on, child, on trial for first degree murder. For both states, this was in spite of a federal law that requires federal juries to reach 
criminal verdicts unanimously. Oregon's system was overturned in 2020. So the non-unanimous jury system no longer exists in the country. Lehman Howard was convicted by a Louisiana jury in 1970 for the murder that occurred in 1966. However, he never faced a jury for the murder of Mrs. Booth in 1960. Yet he was detained by the state of Louisiana for the rest of his life. Based on the information that I presented this thus far, the obstacles that Lehman Howard faced were pretty obvious. His mental disability and the misfortune of being treated by an unethical physician are definitely at the top of the list. But in addition to this, simply living in Louisiana played a huge role. The state of Louisiana basically failed Lehman Howard and demonstrated a complete lack of regard for basic humanity. After his release from Angola in 1977, Lehman Howard was involuntarily committed to the state mental institution for convicted felons based on the recommendation of Dr. Buttersworth. Nine years later, on June 2nd, 1986, Lehman Howard signed a formal involuntary commitment document without notification or input from his family. This is disturbing to me as a healthcare provider. It is illegal to obtain consent from an individual who is mentally impaired. So how then is a mentally disabled individual allowed to sign a document that will ultimately result in the detainment for the rest of his life? Without the benefit of his constitutional right to adequately defend himself and without the support of his family and without financial resources, Lehman Howard received a punishment that he did not deserve. And for the Booth family, justice has also been denied. For me personally, after speaking with the Howard family over the past five years, the fear and sense of powerlessness that they experience is the most disheartening. According to Lehman Howard's sister, their father did find the courage to testify at the lunacy hearing on behalf of his son. In today's world, that doesn't really seem like a big deal, but imagine being a black man in the Jim Crow South trying to speak on behalf of your child who has been wrongfully accused of murdering a white woman. She recalls his demeanor when he returned home and the silence and the silence that ensued among her family members from that day forward. She also described her mother's attitude, which, which much like her father was one of hopelessness. Before her mother's death, and one of the few times she spoke about her son, she asked if they would make sure that Lehman Howard's remains were returned to Frierson for burial at the family's church among his other family members. Despite the financial strain, his sister ensured that his mother's request was fulfilled. Instead of being laid to rest in a pauper's grave on October 4, 2004, Lehman Howard finally made it home. The profound state of fear and silence transcended an entire generation in the Howard family. And this is evidenced by a conversation that I had with Lehman Howard's nephew. In 2004, when he was serving in Afghanistan with the army, he received a Blue Cross message telling him that his uncle had passed away. He was completely caught off guard because until that moment, he didn't even know Lehman Howard existed. Um, this, this kind of blew me away because basically the family never talked about this. It was swept under the rug and it was swept under the rug out of fear, you know? Um, and I can only imagine how painful this must have been for them. Um, during the production phase of the documentary, I spoke with all three of the surviving siblings of Lehman Howard. Only one of them was able to participate on camera. Um, the other two stated that it was just too painful. However, each of them expressed their appreciation for our efforts. As a result, I am motivated to tell this story as often as I can, not only for Lehman Howard, but also for the thousands of vulnerable Americans who suffer with mental illness and the lack of resources to fight for their freedom.